In business, every time you launch a new product, in order to get the momentum behind the new product, you've got to be very careful in putting the case together. You study the market, who are the competitors, can we build them, and so on. You do your very best. You then get the money that you need to launch it, thinking that it will be successful. Turns out that only 20% of the all products launched in the world, uh, only 20% are successful, the other 80% fail. And the question was, I wonder if innovation is just a crapshoot. You do your best, but the best isn't good enough, and you just have to try a bunch of things, and a few will win and most will lose, and you've got to figure out how to live with that. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, Next Estate Specialists, for buying, selling, and managing property in the Berlin market in Germany. You can find the Next Estate at next-estate.com. Welcome back to another episode in the series to celebrate the life and work and theories of the late Clayton Christensen. Today, we have another book that asks a very deep and wide question. And I'm going to start with that question to you. Why do you hire this show? In fact, why do you hire any podcast? Probably depends on your context, what time of day it is where you are, etc. So park that question, and then revisit that question at the end of today's show, because today's book is about progress. Yes, it's a book about innovation and how to get better at it. But at its core, this book is about the struggles we all face to make progress in our lives. If you're like many entrepreneurs and managers, the word progress might not spring to mind when you're trying to innovate. Instead, you obsess about creating the perfect product with the right combination of features and benefits to appeal to customers. Or you try to continually fine tune your existing products so they're more profitable or differentiated from your competitors. You think you know just what your customers would like, but in reality, it can be pretty hit or miss. Place enough bets and with a bit of luck, something will work out. If you want to compete and win against luck, today's book is for you. Before I tell you the name of that book, and for those who know, you know already what it is, I want to introduce our guest today, the co-author of this book, the way the late Clayton Christensen does. He was a student in my first ever class at HBS, Harvard Business School. I can still picture him in the top row right of the aisle between the left and center sections. He and I collaborated several times over the years, perhaps most notably co-authoring the first jobs theory article in the Harvard Business Review. I have turned to him because he always manages to bring out a healthy dose of real world experience, healthy skepticism, combined with genuine zeal for the theories of our discussions. I've come to deeply value his sharp mind, his ability to pull interesting parallels and examples into our conversations, and his good humor and laughter. It is a huge pleasure for me, and I'm, you're going to see for you too, our audience today, to welcome the co-author of this brilliant book, Competing Against Luck, Taddy Hall. Welcome to the show. <laughs> and thanks for that great introduction. It, uh makes me blush and a little bit uh, emotional just to hear Clay's words quoted by you. Uh, he was an unforgettable human being who had a tremendous impact on me and so many others. Let's start with that, Taddy, because I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit about Clay. I've asked everybody in the series about their relationship with Clay, and we've carefully selected for this series people who have worked with Clay, but also experienced moments that can't be captured in a book as well. So perhaps you'll give it a go now and tell us about your relationship. Well, I'll start with the, the with the uh, cover of the book you just held up there, Aiden. Um because it's uh it's a short story that says a lot about who Clay was and how he thought and how he carried himself in the world. So the, our publisher of that book, Harper Collins, showed him 
uh, you know, a draft or a mock-up of the cover. And he said, you know, I, th I think it looks fine. Um, you guys probably know better than I uh, how that should be. I just have one request, Clay said. He said, could you, could you please make everybody else's names the same size as mine? Because I'm really not comfortable with my name being bigger than anybody else's. And uh, the publisher politely declined <laughs> um, for obvious reasons. But that was just his instinctive reaction was, uh, I don't want the credit. I don't deserve the credit. And I want to share that credit uh, equally. And um, I could tell other stories that 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 uh, reflect that same sensibility, but that was clay through and through, and it was completely genuine. As you said, Aiden, I got to know Clay just by one of the great strokes of fortune in my life that I walked into what was called back then, and the, this was 1992 at HBS Tom, which was I think it was like the Theory of Operations Management or something like that. And Clay taught operations, supposedly, but he really taught us about business and ultimately taught us about life. <laughs> and uh, um, I think everybody who was in that class will never forget the gift of being in that class. And obviously at that point, Clay was a, you know, an associate professor and incredibly young and uh, um, not, not the institution that he came to become, but we were all keenly aware that we were in the presence of, of greatness and brilliance and, and just true goodness as a human being. Um, and uh, I have lots and lots of stories, but one thing he mentioned in his, in his remarks that you quoted, um, Aiden was just laughing. And uh, especially when he was, his health wasn't so good, go, so good towards the end, we really enjoyed laughing together. And when he was uncomfortable physically for whatever set of reasons, sometimes we'd go in there with some agenda. And the only thing I really want to do is to make him smile and make him laugh by just sharing some stories and having some fun. And I think a lot of people who knew him maybe didn't know just <laughs> what, what a, a devilish sense of humor he had and how much fun he had just with himself and with those who are around him. And, and uh, I'm looking at my picture on the screen. It just reminds me of one time I walked into his office and of course, you know, he was uh, amazingly tall and you're always looking up to him. And, and yet he had a very soft voice that in some ways belied his, his size and certainly his stature physically and intellectually. And very seriously, he said to me, you know, um, there's something I've been meaning to tell you for about 20 years now. And there's this new technology um, that I think you should know about. And, and it's called a comb. <laughs> 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 and, as you can probably tell, a comb hasn't spent any time in my hair it's many decades. <laughs> and, he, and, and then he just, it just dissolved laughing, you know, and he just, he had that ability just to, to say things um, uh, in a very deadpan voice. And, and he just, he loved to laugh and his whole body would laugh. And, and, and I think that maybe people even who know him didn't just, just know what a, what a, what a hilarious guy he was and, and how, how, um, how unseriously he took himself, you know? And it, it was always like just below the surface and he always, want, you could find the lighter side in, in everything. I noticed that by the way, man, I, I didn't know the man, but in in many of his talks i watched over the years but in particular in researching for this series there's so many little self-deprecating jokes in oh, yeah. amidst all the serious topics etc and it just yeah. makes it a pleasure to listen to and it creates the right atmosphere for learning to happen as well so i can only imagine that's what he did in in the courses that you you were in together so i thought we'd start with the big idea and each of the chapters just to say for our audience each of the chapters opens with the big idea it then finishes with key takeaways and questions for leaders as well so it's really constructed to give you the theories and this was something that was deep in 
the spirit of Clayton Christensen was to give these theories to people to use and improve their life and make progress in many ways. But I, I thought I'd start with the big idea. I'll tee you up with little quotes as we go through today's episode, Taddy. And the That's big good, idea. I'm old and I need all the tip the cues. <laughs> well, you've still got your hair, man. You still need a comb, which is a good thing. So I still have my hair because I don't comb it. I think that's the secret. Is that that is don't that use is. A comb or a brush, and you'll have like yeah. <laughs> hair don't powder. brush it out, man. Don't br- don't brush right. it out. <laughs> exactly so the big right. idea: why is innovation so hard to predict and sustain? So this is building on for those who've been with us for the innovators' dilemma, the innovators' solution, disrupting class, seeing what's next. Because we haven't asked the right questions is the is the theme of the book. Despite the success and enduring enduring utility of disruption as a model of competitive response, it does not tell you where to look for new opportunities. It doesn't provide a roadmap for where or how a company should innovate to undermine established leaders or create new markets. But the theory of jobs to be done does just that. Over to you. <laughs> uh, so where do jobs come from? And the, the, the way that Clay spoke of it was really in the aftermath of um, Innovator's Dilemma and developing the theory of disruption. Uh, and he would sort of laugh and, and, and say how the fame of that book and the, and the publicity it generated precipitated kind of parade of, of executives coming into Clay's office and, and saying in Clay's words, you know, geez, Clay, you give me all kinds of things to be afraid of, you know, <laughs> and, and all these threats that I had never thought about and what I need to worry about. Um, but you haven't really told me what to do, you know, <laughs> and, and, and I understand I'm supposed to be scared and watch out for this, but, but what do I need to do? And and that challenge, in many ways, provided the spark and the impetus for Clay to think about both to reflect on disruption, which, as he said, let's be clear, it's not a, it's not a theory for innovation. It's not a theory for for growth. Disruption is a theory of competitive response, and it accurately predicts how established firms will respond in given circumstances when confronted by uh, uh, a fledgling upstart. And the whole idea there was if you are trying to start a new business and you obviously don't want to start a bar fight with someone who's five times your size and will squish you like a bug, you can leverage the theory of disruption to exploit asymmetries of economic incentive to take root in ways that that the larger firm is likely to ignore, at least until you've gotten to a place of um, of some strength and some resilience. Similarly, if you're a large company, and this goes back to where I started the answer, disruption gives you essentially a set of lenses to look for threats in places you might otherwise ignore them. Um, uh, And Andy Grove uh, of Intel spoke eloquently about that when when presented with Clay's theory of disruption, he started to look for, are there fledgling low cost fabricators? Uh, At that time, memory chips later became microprocessors. And he found that there were. And what the theory helped him do was to say, oh, my gosh, our current resource allocation process and our current way of prioritizing opportunities, we would have just dismissed those guys as irrelevant because we're really focused on our most profitable, largest customers that are demanding and growing fast. But the presence of the theory helped Andy convinced himself and his leadership team to start what became Celeron, the lower cost um, processor division that essentially um, preempted those lower end would be disruptors by starting a totally different 
operation with separate capabilities and resources and processes and metrics. Very few companies have that foresight. But back to the back to the storyline, which is many leaders found disruption to be sort of half satisfying. Right? It was like, what do I do? And Clay embraced the challenge and he realized that actually a theory for growth that would complement disruption was absent. And the more time we spent looking at how resources were allocated when it came to innovation, the more we realized, A, the obvious that's been studied umpteen times that innovation failure rates are staggeringly high, number one. And number two, is that the theory in use embrace this notion that, you know, it really is luck. You, you just, it's very hard to predict. It's, there's, it's just randomness in the universe and there's really no way to um, causally understand what creates successful innovation. And therefore, absent a causal understanding, the best we can do is a model of correlation, right? And Clay used to love telling these stories where he would catalog all of his personal attributes, you know, <laughs> Being, you know, X feet tall and driving a minivan and living in the suburbs of Boston, all these things. And they would say, you know what? But none of those things caused me to buy the New York Times today, <laughs> you know? And, and he would elaborate just to show how flimsy these models were that essentially created rosters of attributes of customers and then in parallel uh, resumes, if you will, of products with all their performance attributes and features and functionality and price point and try and match those things said, okay, well, Clay, you know, we think you're a New York Times reader. We're going to beat you over the head with it, you know, whatever it was. But obviously that builds in a lot of waste um, uh, into the innovation process. As Edwards Deming, the father of the quality movement uh, said, he said a lot of things that were way too sophisticated for me to understand, but this is one that I actually can can get my head around, which is, Every process is perfectly designed to produce the outputs that it produces. Right? So, so unwittingly, to a certain extent, many of us had built innovation processes that were perfectly designed to generate highly inconsistent outputs and results. And we accepted that as just the way things were in kind of a tautological way of, well, that's what always comes out of it. Therefore, the way it, Clay was never comfortable with that. And, and, he, and, and, and he, he felt that there, we must, there must be a better understanding or better explanation available, or as he would always say, a theory, a circumstance specific explanation of cause and effect that we could employ to make innovation decisions with greater precision and more consistent success. And that is ultimately where jobs to be done came from. Um, there were lots of people involved. Like, uh, reminds me a little bit of working with Procter and Gamble a million years ago. And, and anytime there was something really successful, like the Swiffer, right? <laughs> I think almost every one of the hundreds of thousands of people who work for, for P&G had a critical hand in Swiffer, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? Um, but the product that they launched that was supposed to replace butter and actually gave people terrible indigestion, you know, digestive problems. Nobody seemed to have anything to do with that one, right? So, <laughs> you know, it's, so there's something about success having, so there's anyone who I think claims paternity for jobs to be done 
probably overreaches. And there was lots and lots of people whose ideas came together to help, you know, crystallize you know, the, 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 the theory. And yes, you alluded to it in the beginning, Clay and, and Scott Cook, uh, the founder of Intuit, the three of us wrote an article in HBR in 2005 called Marketing Malpractice. And that was the first time Jobs Be Done was really trotted out as a, as, as a theory more, more, more broadly. But I would never claim to be the, the creator of this. And there are many, many others who were involved. But the point is, we started to formulate this hypothesis, again, with the help of many, many others. And you alluded to my good friend and longtime collaborator and collaborator of Clay's, Bob Mesta. He was very, very involved as well. Um, there was a period of time where I, I worked for the Nielsen Company. And at 2011 to 2017. And what was exciting there was that, um, amongst other things, Nielsen had access to the data of every single new consumer packaged good that was launched in the U.S. market, which is about 3,500 SKUs. And the nice thing, as Clay said, that about consumer packaged goods is it's, it's kind of like using fruit flies for your study because their life cycle is so short that you can study them um, uh, uh, with great efficiency and effectiveness. And since many of them failed, it allowed us to create models uh, based on past successes and failures and to then tease out through these models um, the causal determinants uh, and then to build models and then test those on, 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 future, on future launches. Long story short, what access to that data allowed us to do was to establish that, and this is important, that jobs to be done wasn't simply descriptive of innovation success, but it actually was predictive of innovation success. In other words, how people responded when they find themselves in circumstances of struggle where they're evaluating options, weighing trade-offs, and ultimately making decisions to move forward in their lives, you could predict the characteristics of an offering that they would pull into their lives in that circumstance in order to achieve the desired progress, create those desired experiences based on an understanding of the value code that they brought to those circumstances. And what was important, especially in so many industries, I think of technology or financial services or automotive, where companies and managers managers specifically, because companies don't decide anything, people do, reduce their value proposition to the functional attributes of their offering, performance dimensions of certain features, and the associated price point were wildly um, misconstruing how products actually created value in the lives of customers. And it's important to know whether those are B2B customers or industrial customers or consumers in the marketplace. And that there were powerful emotional dimensions around almost every product, as well as social dimensions. How am I gonna be perceived by my friends, my neighbors, my colleagues, people on, on Facebook? Think of something like financial services. You know, it's like, wow, we all have so much emotion wrapped around those. And, you know, maybe some shame for decisions we've made in the past, some embarrassment that I can't explain finances very well to my children, frustration and in, 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 in not being able to get on the same page with my spouse. You know, things like finances are, are emotional way before they're functional or practical. And yet for you know, decades, most financial institutions talk very much about, you know, the terms of a credit card or the 
benefits of an APR on a, and, and yet they're completely not connecting with you know a person who's really struggling with some important decision in their lives and they're addressing just that thin layer of it. So and this is a very, very long way of answering your very reasonable and short question, which was where did jobs come from? What caused the impetus for it? And if I can come full circle, you know, the impetus for jobs to be done, which is Clay always said, is a causal explanation of growth. In other words, it is a theory for growth that complements disruption, which is a theory for competitive response. And often when I teach innovation, um, whether that's to students or executives or apply the theories in the world, it's using both of those theories uh, in tandem to identify opportunities that take root in disruption and then to construct propositions uh, products, services, customer experiences that are designed to enable the progress that a group of individuals seek in a recurring circumstance. It's great, man. I'm I'm so glad you pulled on the idea of theory because <clears throat> I, I I often hear about jobs to be done, but very few people mention the theory. And I had it in there. It's like I I gotta I gotta make sure, Taddy, and you you absolutely nailed it, man, because it's such an important aspect. And one of the things I love is when you you guys talk about the idea. It's like lenses you put on, and then you look at whatever problem or yeah. challenge. And you see it entirely differently. It, it gives you this new way. I often think of that movie Predator, and you know the way he can see things differently. <laughs> right. And, and you, you, like you're in Chile at the moment, you're kindly joining us. Predators in the jungles, he can see you in infrared and sees things entirely differently. And and this is what Jobs theory does. I wanted to build on something you said there. So that that's Jobs, and and something I said in the intro was what job do you hire a podcast for but then what's really important is the circumstance or the context and and you write in the book you have to understand the job the customer is trying to do in a specific circumstance if the company simply tried to average all the responses of the dads and commuters for example it would come up with one size fits none <laughs> product that doesn't do either job well and it's in there that there's an aha moment one of the things I often say to clients is that, you know, opportunity does not lie at that smooth center, right, of like the averages. It's, it's on the funky fringes, right, that you find these unexpected compensating behaviors, these kind of kludged together workarounds, people using your product in unexpected ways. You know, we talked about in marketing malpractice, Scott Cook talked about the early days of QuickBooks when he designed this software po package that was ostensibly for individuals, not small business owners. And yet he found small business owners using it to you know, manage their cash flow and stuff. And he couldn't understand it. It spent quite a while trying to make sense of it. And finally, he realized that these poor people found you know, small business accounting software totally overwhelming and intimidating and only took their existing anxiety and elevated it and gave them new things to worry about, but didn't actually help them make progress. And as he said, once we understood what we were, what, what these entrepreneurs were struggling to achieve, which was basically, I don't really want to think about accounting or finances. I just want to build my small business without this constant worry of running out of cash. And, and once Scott got his head around that, he says, you know, we redesigned and relaunched our product focused on small businesses, and it had half the functionality of the small business uh, packages on the market. And we sold it at twice the price, and we quickly dominated the market. You know, and so you you find these these opportunities out there, uh, but they're rooted in those unexpected behaviors. And there's a reason that Clay had a sign that you may have heard about or even seen that he made um, uh, in his office that said, you know, anomalies wanted. And that was his way of reminding everyone who walked in the door 
that it was the funky fringes that you would find these unexpected behaviors that were actually the faint signal of innovation opportunity. And the last thing I'll say, I wrote a small piece for Harvard Business Review a number of years ago with a, a, a friend and collaborator, Eddie, Eddie Yoon, where we talked about the difference, and you talked about this earlier, Adam, the, the important of mind, importance of mindset, of when you encounter something unexpected and seemingly bizarre, of, do, you react, do you react to that unexpected use case and say, well, that's weird and dismiss it? Or do you react to it saying, hey, that's funny. Maybe there's something I don't understand and immerse and step into it with more of the beginner's mind of trying to understand what somebody's doing. And, and that difference of reacting with a, that's funny, that's interesting, rather than a, that's weird and dismiss it, is a little bit of that mindset of learning to look with new eyes that uh, uh, I often in talks like to quote uh, Marcel Proust because he was obviously smarter and more articulate than I, but Proust said the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new sites, not running off to find new things, but in having new eyes. And in many ways, what we do with jobs to be done is, and you said this too, offer a set of lenses that allows smart, sophisticated experts in their field to look at phenomena that they've looked at many, many times before, and yet to see things that they've never seen before. Oh, uh, man, I love, I love that quote, that Proust quote. It's absolutely beautiful. I, I, there's another one that, that you might know. The science fiction writer Asimov once wrote that the most remarkable theory, the most remarkable quote when somebody stumbles upon a new anomaly in science yes. is not Eureka, but it's, huh, that's funny. But... That, I, yes, I often think I, I, love that. <laughs> I, I often think that the, one of the problems, and this is where culture comes in so important, is if you're too busy executing all the time or too busy overly focused, which is a good thing, but if you don't allow yeah. those moments for to spot the anomalies or to regularly, yeah. as you said, beginner's mind, you miss those. Oh, that's funny moments, and that's where the often the threat or the opportunity is. That's exactly right. And I have so many, uh, so many examples of, um, uh, of, 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 of successful innovators um, finding and starting, you know, huge, uh, huge, huge businesses on the back of these funny little unexpected anomalies that, you know, others would have dismissed. And yet they... Um, uh, it, it embraced. And, um, you know, a great example of that is, um, I don't know if you ever, do you ever, do you ever hear the, the, the drink in the U S called a Mountain Dew kickstart? Oh yeah, man. <laughs> so, so the team that, the team that, that, that launched that, um, you know, they knew that Mountain Dew as a beverage over indexed in the morning, uh, amongst, uh, 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 carbonated soft drinks, and 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 they knew that 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 it also overindexed with 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 young men, and that it was a top selling skew in um, in convenience stores. And so, spending some time in these stores, what they realized, trying to understand all of these, you know, that's funny, surprising details, was that. There was debt. There was this population of, of 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 young guys mostly, who would wake up kind of groggy and need to put themselves in a position to go to work and be professional. And they just didn't like the taste of coffee. They love Mountain Dew, but the idea of going into the office or into a job with a you know a twenty liter thing of soda never seemed quite appropriate. And um, and so they would stop off at a 7-Eleven or a convenience store and buy a Mountain Dew and a little thing of orange juice and you know borrow a cup there from the from the the, the fountain soda stand and 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 create essentially their own little breakfast cocktail of a little Mountain Dew and look 
And, and I can't tell you how many managers I've worked with would have seen that and said, well, that's just weird, you know? And, and maybe some small number of, of, of managers would say, oh, you know what we should do? We should do an orange flavored Mountain Dew, you know? And I think it was really this uh, a very, very like, you know, single digit percentage of managers who would say, hey, you know what? Let's really try and understand what's going on there and, 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 and what the team at, at Mountain Dew uh, came to discover is, this is really about transition and transformation. It's a bigger idea than just flavor. Anyhow, you know, the Mountain Dew brand was launched and, and uh, sorry, not the Mountain Dew, the, the, the Mountain Dew Kickstart brand was launched. Really thinking about this morning transformation, um, I created, created a new brand that grew to multi-billion dollars that was totally incremental to their Mountain Dew carbonated soft drink business and to their Rockstar Energy uh, business. Um, and the last thing I'll say that is because the core premise of the brand was these enabling transitions, while not explicitly said, hey, have this in the morning, it was perfectly positioned to be available in those circumstances. The next evolution of Kickstart Innovations were actually aimed at, at, at an evening crowd where people were transitioning from kind of being at home to kind of going out on the town and something that I guess folks younger than I call pre-gaming, where they would want a little pick-me-up before heading out. Um, and while they loved an energy drink, you know, having kind of a, you know, a Red Bull or Rockstar before going, didn't feel quite right, but that these alternatively flavored Mountain Dew Kickstarts actually were, a, again, perfectly designed for that circumstance. So, um yeah, anomalies are where the opportunities are. One of the things you you sparked to to share, I, I think it's important to share, and you do this in the book, is when you're looking at jobs, understand what is not a job. So you say, for example, it's not a product. It's not you're looking for a product. What you're looking for is where, as you said, on the fuzzy edges, where the customer or the consumer is looking for progress. There's a there's a distinction there that's really important. <laughs> and Scott Cook was is probably one of lots of people who never really liked the phrasing, you know, jobs to be done. He's like, God, that's so clunky. You know, it's just not it doesn't it's it's is there something shorter or catchier like jobs to be done? Like, God, it just sounds it just Sounds clumsy, and, and and I think Clay and I and many would sort of agree. <laughs> you know, it's it's not a very elegant turn of phrase. Jobs to be done, um, uh, but it's in the to be done where all the magic is. You know, and 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 I never like to sort of pit jobs or or ideas against other frameworks or or, or approaches. But, you know, lots of marketers talk about thing, talk about, say, need states. And, and sometimes I'm asked to describe, like, well, what's the difference between like a need or a need state and a job? And and again, this could boil down to kind of a vapid some debate of semantics. But the, the challenge, the problem with needs is that we all have lots of them, you know, and I need to need to sleep more or need to eat better or need to spend more time with my kids and need to take my my heart medication, I need to save more for a time. You could go like, we're all just barrels of needs. Um, unfortunately for would-be innovators is we're not acting on a lot of them, you know? And so you might look at me and say, aha, you know, you need a comb, <laughs> right? But I don't want to comb, you know, I, you know, having, you know, uh, normal hair is not a job to be done that I have. You may say I have anyhow. you get the point, but the, the meaning there is what's resident in the phrase jobs to be done is there is palpable energy for progress. It's not simply an abstract, externally observed, aha, you look like someone who needs a comb and maybe a nicer looking shirt, um, et cetera. But it's rooted in my own energy for where I am trying to make progress, where I'm struggling 
in my life and trying different uh, things on to try and resolve that circumstance. It's that energy for progress that actually is the touchstone of innovation opportunity. And if there is no energy, and this is important, if there's no energy for progress in a given circumstance, if everything's just smooth sailing, there's really no innovation opportunity. So you can use jobs to be done also in, in some ways for a sense of like negative discovery. You need to be searching for energy. Uh, where are people struggling? Not, for example, for differentiation, which is, which is a highly unpredictable navigational device that many, many companies use. How do we differentiate? How to be different from whatever's on the shelf next to yours or, you know, whether that's a virtual shelf or a physical shelf is totally irrelevant to your customers. They're not looking to buy things that are differentiated. They couldn't care less. They're looking for solutions that will help them make progress. And so the beauty of jobs to be done is, is it provides a tool set, a set of lenses to would-be innovators that allow them to think, go back to something you said, but essentially a mindset and a tool set that is much more durable, durable and reliable than things like a need state where they're may not be actually any energy, energy for progress behind it, or differentiation, which might lead you to white space in the market, which is white space for a very, very good reason. You know? it's like, and, and so, you know, what job does, it helps direct would-be innovators to where there's predictably opportunity for, for successful innovation. You, you mentioned there the word direct, and there's a, a really interesting and useful thought experiment that you propose that we use to be able to see the job so this is how do i spot jobs i'm on board i totally agree with you Taddy. i gotta see jobs and you say here fully understanding a customer's job requires understanding the progress a customer is trying to make in particular circumstances and understanding all of its functional social and like you said emotional dimensions as well as the trade-offs the customer is willing to make and this is where you go be a director, make a movie, create a, a short story here, and that short story should entail what progress the person is trying to achieve, what are the circumstances of the struggle, what obstacles are getting in the way, are consumers making do with imperfect solutions, and how would they define what quality means for a better solution? Just listening to you talk, Aiden, like I had all these different... <laughs> stories popping up in my head. And uh, uh, when you first started talking, I was thinking about fast food breakfast. And I, Clay always loved talking about fast food. Um, <laughs> I uh, landing on something that I, I wrote about and was involved in, I don't know, ooh, seven or eight years ago, probably, which was was Kimberly Clark. And, uh, uh, and they're category leaders in uh, uh, their their adult undergarment business and brand of Depend. It's very important you say Depend when you work with Kimberly Clark, not Depends, because Depends sounds like uncertain, right? Like, it depends, maybe. No, Depend means you can count <laughs> on it, any event. Um, one of the things that the team there realized, and this, this gets to one of Clay's favorite topics, which is the which is the, the concept of non-consumption. As marketers, as researchers, we're very good at going out and measuring consumption. Because you know? uh, consumption data is just the exhaust of commerce, the exhaust of activity, and we can capture that exhaust and, and stick it into spreadsheets and analyze, et cetera. But the problem with non-consumption is obviously there's no exhaust, there's no activity. It's much harder to measure non-consumption, and in some cases, harder than others. In the case of um, uh, bladder control, it was a little bit easier for uh, 
fo- that for the for the folks at Kimberly Clark to manage because you could get data on the percentage of adults that had bladder control issues and you could then map that up against you know uh, uh, penetration of the category and how many people were buying, you know, shopping that category and in what volumes, because that data was, was, was available. In any event, one of the, one of the uh, key starting points for this work was that, that folks suffering from bladder control issues would often spend several years uh, employing a whole array of compensating behaviors before ever shopping the category. And just to, to, Short, shortcut the story, there were obviously huge stigmas about using these products, shopping for these products. They kind of felt like diapers for adults. And, 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 and I don't even want to put those in my cart at the store. And, 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 you know, I tried them once and they kind of made a noise. And my granddaughter asked me like why my pants were like making, you know, it's like you, there was a lot of resistance. So people were doing crazy, crazy things. And without going into all the details, the number one thing that really galvanized the imaginations and the energies of the team at Kimberly Clark was people were withdrawing socially, right? They were just not going to restaurants, not going to the theater, not going to their grandchildren's plays, just not, not doing stuff. And that finding provided this impetus internally to the team there of we're going to give these people half their lives back by enabling them to re-engage. And what was important, and you alluded to this, Aiden, is it that the, the solution, yes, it was part technological, like there was something about developing, because what the, let me pause. There was absolutely some technology and some innovation required along the performance attributes of the product, for sure. But the real competition, if you will, was just the stigma. You know, we had to, they had to do something that would compete with non-consumption, that would compete with people saying, like, I'm just going to stay home. I'm not going to go out. And, 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 and to do that, um, they had to really reimagine, reframe the whole category. And, and what they ultimately came out with, with, which was real fit briefs for men and silhouette for, 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 for women, were not positioned as adult under, undergarments. They were positioned as underwear. And, 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 and get this, they were actually were launched in the U.S. with a Super Bowl ad of famous football stars talking about, you got to try these great new underwear I have. And so they were promoted like underwear. They were merchandised, not in a big shrink wrap like thing like diapers, but in a box with like a three pack where you could see them. And it really competed directly with this notion that these are diapers for adults. And in other words, it dramatically expanded the category, created the ca- essentially re-engineered or redefined a category um, based on that understanding of what these consumers were actually struggling to do and the value codes that they were bringing to these circumstances, which were resulting in them withdrawing socially rather than shop a category, which all the manufacturers could say, ah, you have a need for this. You need this product. Indisputable. I have bladder control issues. I need this product. I'm not buying it. Oh, why not? And that's that energy for progress, the job to be done. That's where the innovation lay, right? And understanding the energy for progress and the value code by which these people were navigating those situations, that provided the clue to what became one of the most successful new product launches in the mid two two thousand the mid two thousand teens. Is that how you say it? Um, not, not a observed need of, Hey, you need a bladder control undergarment because that never would have led them to the solution that embraced all of the emotional and social dimensions of that struggle. And the last thing I'll say on this, but I mentioned the packaging, 
The PAC team was also launched with images of people wearing clothes that they say they couldn't wear anymore. You know, so you had these pictures of, you know, women wearing like a red cocktail dress or, you know, tight fitting jeans, but clothes that people specifically said they no longer wore because of their bladder control issues. So it really spoke directly to these people in the circumstances uh, in which they, 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 they encountered these, these challenges. And that idea of non-consumption and actually knowing how to uncover or how to spot it, it means that there's no competitor there. That's, I think that's one of the things I absolutely love about jobs to be done is that you can uncover either a threat, but also an opportunity that was staring you right in the face, but you didn't know, you didn't have the right lenses to see it. That's right. That's right. And, you know, I spent a lot of time still um, for 25 years. I've worked with a, a nonprofit in emerging markets called Endeavor. And, um, and Clay was always interested to hear about these companies that, that, that we were helping and working with uh, through Endeavor and emerging markets. And it's a, it's a nonprofit dedicated to helping high impact entrepreneurs develop truly scalable businesses that create wealth and jobs and hope in emerging markets. And one of the reasons that Clay loved these businesses so much is they were routinely taking root in markets of non-consumption. And, and in fact, um, uh, dear friends, uh, Karen Dillon and, and Efoso Ajomo, and they worked with Clay on this terrific, terrific book, Prosperity Paradox. And a number of the companies that um, are, are, are profiled there um, were taken from the Endeavor network. And so many of them um, were rooted in, in this idea of non-consumption, whether that was Clinica Sukar, which, which introduced diabetes clinics to tens of millions of Mexicans who were suffering from diabetes, but had no access to care or treatment at a reasonable price point. Or Narayana Health, which was focused on bringing high quality cardiac care to the millions of Indians who had cardiac issues but couldn't afford um, the cost of care. Um, or Micro Insure, which was focused on, uh, uh, on uninsured populations um, in emerging markets, realizing that there was this weird anomaly in the in the life and healthcare insurance businesses that the, actually the people who needed this product most were the least likely to have it. And, and, and again, again and again and again, in emerging markets, you would find these huge populations of non-consumption. And it's really that innovator's mindset of seeing non-consumption not as at the absence of opportunity, because all the markets are so small, but quite to the contrary, to, to see emerging markets as wide open areas of opportunity because there's so much non-consumption. Um, and it's that creative understanding of where's the energy for progress, not where are the large markets of, 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 of consumption which are actually signals of, 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 of successful innovation of the past. Right? <laughs> Somebody has already identified that market and addressed it and created this consumption. As, as Peter Drucker taught us, you know, the, the, the job of the enterprise is to create customers. And, and, and that's what we do successfully in every transaction is the creation of a customer. And so often we as marketers and innovators forget that we're in the business of enabling progress. And in the context of enabling that progress, we introduce a solution, the consequence of what, which is consumption that can be measured. But the core construct is the creation of a customer by introducing a solution that fulfills a high priority but poorly performed job to be done in the life of that customer. 
It reminds me, Taddy, I don't know if you've heard about the, there's a, a joke and it's about two shoe salesmen. So one shoe salesman, they land in this new land and one shoe salesman rings home uh, to his boss and he's like, boss, I got to come home. Nobody here wears shoes. And the other shoe salesman rings home to his wife and he goes, honey, pack up the kids. Huge opportunity here. No one wears shoes. And it reminded me of exactly what you're talking about there. That's a much shorter shorter and much simpler story (laughs) than the long winding one I told. You can take it, man. It's yours. But (laughs) let's... um, Let's move on to something that's really important. This and this is often overlooked with jobs theory is when you look at the customer, you observe the customer, you have to train your eye to see how strong the status quo bias is, because you mentioned emotion many times, but the emotional pull to I often think about like gravitational pull to a planet, the pull to the to the to what you do today is very strong. And you ask a very, very important question. What needs to be fired in order for you to hire my new product or my new idea? Yeah, and that is that notion of kind of you know, forces for progress. And Bob Mesta, um, uh, I think, coined that term, kind of the forces for progress. And, and you know, it's, it's a very useful construct because particularly in business, we spend a lot of time thinking about essentially the magnetism of our offering, you know, and the features and functions of our offering that make it attractive. Right? But and, and we say, boy, if we can just bundle all these attributes together and wrap them up and stick them in a product or a service, you know, we're golden. And the problem with that is, is it overlooks um, that, as you said, in order for a new product to be hired, some other solution needs to be fired. Now, that also could be some compensating behavior like we talked about previously that results in non-consumption. But even that solution of saying, in the case of the Kimberly Clark Depend, of withdrawing uh, withdrawing socially, that essentially needs to be replaced with a new behavior if you're actually going to get somebody into the category, so to speak. And typically we don't think as deeply about um, inertia, attachment to just, hey, it's not perfect, but, uh, you know, I travel a lot for business. Do I stay at like the the coolest and the hippest places? Uh, I do not. But you know what? I'm there for a night or two. It's a known commodity. It's not worth it to me to go out and try to find some fabulous little gem of a hotel in Dallas or Charlotte or Wichita. You know, it's just easier to go with something familiar, even if it's not the best. And so somebody who who would like innovate around some fabulous boutique hotel and say, you know, wouldn't you like, it's just my inertia in that context is 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 sufficiently high that I'm actually not, I don't have energy for something better for a night or two. If I might be staying for a month in a city, suddenly my my value code shifts, right? I'm looking for a month. Okay, then there's other things that I might have uh, uh, in, in, my, in, in, my, in my criteria. Um, inertia is powerful. The other is anxiety of, well, I hear what you're saying, but is is this, you know, is it going to work? Is, you, you know, if you keep the hotel example, it's like, well, I don't know. Is, is it going to be clean? You know, it sounds cool. But I mean, is, is it going to have like outlets, plenty of outlets where I can charge things? Is the TV going to work? Is the air conditioner going to make terrible noise? Like if I have a problem, like, you know, you have all these things start to creep up in your head of, these unknowns associated with the unknown (laughs) and that perceived anxiety. You can think of that in a B2B context of, geez, if I buy, um, you know, business insurance uh, from this, this new business, you know, what if it's not a well-established or well-financed company? And, 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 you know, what are, what's my boss going to say if he says you bought what from whom? And, and so there's, We often, as would-be innovators, overweight our analysis 
on the attributes of our offering and don't address sufficiently the forces of inertia and anxiety that conspire against switching. We've talked about the idea of looking through the lenses many times. And we, we kind of said how a you can look for opportunities. And that's what jobs is really about looking for these kind of opportunities or where there's struggle and, and progress, the desire for progress. But I'd love you to share an example of looking at a business or a, a, an industry or a, a, a product or service and actually see things entirely different than maybe previous competitors would have seen it. Such a great question. And, and, and there's literally a dozens of examples pop into my mind. I think, you know, I might, I might, I might talk about Uber just because so many people talk about it as this tremendous disruption. And yet, you know, one of the reasons that disruption sometimes is criticized is because people use disruption almost like a bumper sticker to apply on anything that's different. Um, when disruption is actually a very tight theory that applies in very specific circumstances and again applies specific phenomena. But Uber in many ways isn't disruptive at all to um, uh, the short term or short haul transportation business. You know, it's actually, it's not, it doesn't take root at the low end of the market. It actually took, took root at the higher end of sort of more demanding uh, uh, transportation buyers who were seeing like, they were not only were they not using taxis, but they were using, say, you know, black cars, as they're called in, in New York City and fleet vehicles and, and chauffeur services. And so they were really, in many ways, like a sustaining innovation, not a disruptive innovation when it comes to transportation. Um, but the offerings in that category were perceived as so poor, you know, taxis were you know so unreliable and expensive and 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 often dirty and unreliable. And especially if the weather was bad, you could never find find one. Um, but Uber's not disruptive in that context, not at all. It is a, it is a, it is a sustaining innovation that af that actually targets the higher end of the more demanding customers of the market with a, with a better offering. But you could say in another way that Uber was disruptive to labor markets and disruptive of of other business models that were looking to hire inexpensive part-time workers to staff their particular businesses. So you can see how fast food businesses or a Starbucks um, or a Target or a Walmart might feel the pain of Uber coming into their market and actually offering a highly attractive value proposition is someone who's maybe a student and looking to work flexible hours for a certain time, a, a certain amount of, uh, of hours given a week in a given week. And, and depending on how their class load is going, they might have more time or less time and they would want to pick the hours. Wow. If I'm Starbucks or Walmart, that's, 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 that's a real threat that I have trouble to compete with because I need people to work in my stores at these very particular, at these certain hours. And, and now I'm facing a threat that is exploiting in many ways asymmetries uh, of my capabilities. It's very hard for me to say, oh, you want to you work as a barista? You can work whenever you want. You know, well, that doesn't really work for Starbucks because you, have, you might have 10 people show up for this slot and no one show up for that slot. And so you can see how through the lens of the theories, Uber was not disruptive to uh, you know, the taxi, the black car market. It was actually a sustaining innovation that offered a better product to more demanding customers. But in many ways, it was quite disruptive of the labor models that were employed by many retail companies that were looking for flexible part-time workers. Um, and suddenly Uber came in and offered a very different business model where I, as the employee, can suddenly choose my hours, right? And so 
What I think is so beautiful about the theories, and whether that's in this case disruption or jobs to be done, is it allows you to look at industry change and innovation, in this case, it's in hindsight, and see how a given company and a given business model took root and in which areas of that market they were actually, say, a sustaining success, right? In the context of the, you know, the, the taxi or the, the transportation market, Uber was really sustaining innovation. But in the, in the context of, 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 of part-time uh, uh, job opportunities, uh, part-time earning, Uber was disruptive to the models of, a, of, of, of many retailers. And that's, that's really the power of the theory is it allows you to see things in, in very different ways and then think about creating opportunities. Uh, because in that case, if you want to go back, you could say, if you were to sort of re, re, reverse engineer uh, the opportunity, you might not come up with Uber. But what you could see is, wow, there's a huge population of people out there that are looking for short-term, flexible ways to earn money. And today, gosh, they're, they're, maybe they're trying to get a shift here at Starbucks or maybe you know, uh, you know, work part-time as a delivery driver for Domino's. Like, but you could see that if you spent time with those people, like none of those solutions would have been very satisfying. You know, it's like, well, I, you know, I don't really have control over my hours and I, I, I actually have trouble keeping the job because I can't meet the schedule, right? And so you would have seen a lot of frustration, a lot of energy for progress. You would have seen a lot of non-consumption where people say like, I could really... I could benefit from working 10 hours a week, but I can't give you a fixed time, right? And so you might not have come up with Uber, you know, you might come up with 10 other different ideas, but that energy for progress would have been palpable and, and, and something that you know, many innovators could, could take advantage of. In the book, you talk about, so jobs at the end, towards the end of the book, you start to focus the mind and kind of go, okay, now you've either found a job you've solved for a job you've seen the job you've identified a product or service that solves that job to be done but then you have an established product and you have then a brand and i'd love you to share because this is talks to the work that you do today a lot of work with brands and i'd love you to share about brands and disruption and brands and innovation brands have been i, I you know sort of admired and they, they've almost had like sort of a mystical quality to them. You know, it's like that we, we all have a handful of brands that we love. Um, we often struggle to articulate quite what it is that we love about them. And, um, uh, and, and, and it, as financial analysts, we value them and we know that they are powerfully valuable, but the, Again, sort of that causal mechanism of what causes uh, a brand to be valued by a, a given set of, of, of people in a given circumstance has often proven elusive. And we're sort of left with just, you know, things like, you know, love, which actually is is an appropriate, kind of, like I love this brand, actually is a, a good predictor in some ways of, 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 of brand, brand loyalty and brand um, uh, preference. Um, but what we found, we spent a lot of time studying in my current work, um, how, what, what explains, as we call these go-to brands, what explains, what is it about like this handful of brands that you have, or I have in our lives that really hold outsized importance, you know, amongst the sea of other brands that are out there. Cause we all have, again, that small set of brands. And so, Again, we've been able to access, you know, years of data on brands and conduct extensive analysis uh, with customers across multiple markets and, and, and many, many categories. And, and what's interesting is, um, is, is what it is that these, you know, go-to brands do. And even before I get into that, just defining a brand is tricky, right? Like, how do you define brand? You go out there, if you Google it, you probably get thousands of definitions. They're not necessarily right or wrong. 
But I spent a fair amount of time thinking about this and 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 analyzing this with um, another Harvard Business School pr professor who I love and admire and was a great fan and friend of Clay's, uh, Jerry Zaltman. And Jerry was is is and was a wonderful thinker and brilliant um, uh, academic and consultant who lives at the intersection of marketing and neuroscience, which is. You know, now people talk about like neuromarketing, but, but Jerry was a real pioneer in that field. And Jerry and I have spent a lot of time thinking about brand and, and using some of his technology and techniques to uncover brands. And what's beautiful about the language that Jerry gave us is he's saying a brand, a brand can best be thought of as shorthand. A brand is shorthand for an experience that is stored in the mind in the form of a story. So you, you have in your head, if you think of a brand, and obviously it's hard to look inside your own head, but when you see a brand, it triggers a metaphor or a story of anticipated experience. And, and it's that associated experience that activates in the presence of that brand in a given circumstance. And that's what essentially creates the meaning and the value. But that notion of brand is just shorthand for an experience um, stored in the memory in the form of a story, because as Jerry demonstrates very powerfully in lots of his books and papers, that really is the essential unit of our memory is metaphor and story, which is why we remember stories uh, so easily and, and really why Clay used stories so extensively because stories connect and score, stories resonate and trigger. Simply spouting out facts and figures and data, it just bounces off of us, you know, w water off a duck. But stories activate our imagination, and engage with our memories in the ways that our minds work. So that's brands. How do you explain the brands that that actually outperform uh, others. And they do really two things. One is they enable tremendous progress in our lives and they create deep connection with us. Now, the connection part is, I think is, is, is reasonably straightforward and is best um, expressed by that answer that quite to the question of, I love this brand. You know, and people who say they love that brand, that's a brand that understands them, that people feel cares about me and actually can help me in the world. And this is where the progress piece is really interesting in terms of the data, because I think there's a piece of progress that's un unsurprising, which is this brand allows me to do things that I wasn't able to do before. And so there's something about uniquely enabling progress that I wasn't able to do before. But, the, and this is fascinating, the bigger driver of perceived and experienced progress isn't from that more functional enables me to achieve things I couldn't achieve before. But the experience of progress is actually more associated with this brand makes me feel part of something bigger than myself. And, 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 and what that reveals is something that social scientists and psychologists would probably find unsurprising, but the normal folks like me find very surprising, which is feeling part of something bigger than ourselves is a deep, powerful human force that we want to be part, whether that's a family, a church, a club, a, a group of Peloton users, uh, of, 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 of Dunkin' Donuts customers versus, you know, that we like to be part of things that are larger than ourselves and successful brands, we call these go-to brands, do that in ways that their competitors don't. Yes, there are you know, they maybe enable progress, but the progress dimension that's more functional 
often is more easily copied and replicated. You know, even like, you know, what Netflix did initially in terms of allowing uh, all, people to experience content, you know, real time, whatever they wanted, however they wanted, that initially was a experience that really you could only get from Netflix. Other firms co copied the technology, but for many people, that experience of being part of Netflix um, eclipsed just the ability to consume content. Um, and, and I could buy lots of stationary bikes, but being part of the Peloton community is powerful and meaningful to me. You know, I think one of the reasons that Pinterest is such a beloved brand isn't just because of the, of the, of the stuff that allows me to share, but allows me to find groups of people who share my passion and interest in whatever I'm passionate and interested in. So I think over recent years, our desire to have an understanding of what causes um, successful brands um, the same way that we can, uh, and we're now able to describe and predict successful innovations has gotten a lot stronger through some research that we've been able to do that, that connects brand and innovation. And by the way, just to close the gap, successful brands systematically and consistently fulfill high priority, but poorly perform jobs to be done in people's lives. So there's a very strong relationship between jobs to be done and go-to brands. Beautifully wrapped up, man. Beautifully tied up in a bow and uh, put it all together. Taddy, we've come to the end and I know you have an appointment now as well. So for people who want to know more about this, I'm J J Bob Mesta will be on the show doing a follow-up episode to build on the work that Taddy talked about today. But Taddy, Bob for Bob. people who want to find out about your work and want to speak to you about what's your work in Lippincott, where can they find you? Well, they can always find me. Uh, they, they, they'll struggle to find me on social media, but they can always find me by, by email. And I try and be very responsive. I'm okay on LinkedIn. But uh, yes, my email, which is taddy.hall at lippincott.com is a fairly reliable way of finding me. Man, I'm so grateful for you taking the time out. You haven't even seen your wife been traveling all around the world. And yeah. you took the time out to spend two hours with us. And I'm very, very grateful co-author of Competing Against Look, Taddy Hall. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been my pleasure to be with you, Aiden. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Wish you all the best. Nice one, man. Thank you so much. That was really, really fun. As always, thank you to our sponsor, Next Estate, specialists for English speakers for buying, selling, and managing property in the Berlin market in Germany. You can find Next Estate at next-estate.com.